I'm a visual artist. I became a visual artist because there was so much I wanted to see. I wanted to learn to see, and I wanted to learn how to see. And of course, I wanted to save the world. <laughs> or at least have some effect on contemporary culture. In my early career, as part of what was referred to as the dematerialization of the art object, we were doing away with everything, trying to find the essence of what art was, what you now call installations. And I hope you can see in this object, I was not only doing away with its modification, not only doing away with its, its uh, permanence, but doing away with its physical existence. It was both transparent and reflective. And I discovered this device called a laser. It was a state-of-the-art product. And it had a very special quality. What you see here is an outline of two triangles of diagonal versus space. It's made with two lasers. The beams are running in opposite directions. The beams are more apparent when they're coming toward you. So on this end of the space, you see the baseline of one and two sides of the other. You walk to the other end of the space, and it appears that you're seeing exactly the same thing, but what you're really seeing is everything that you haven't seen before. This is a little simpler version. What you see here is an eight and a half foot two by four. Again, this very early work. Propped against the wall, the gallery spotlight is controlled in such a way that we see a shadow on the floor and the wall. And it creates a gestalt understanding of a triangle. In fact, there's a full plane of darkness that passes through that space. You can't see it, you don't have the perceptual ability. You can walk up to it, stick your hand in it, and you see the darkness on your hand. I was looking for a way to try and make this apparent, to try and expand our perceptual abilities. And I built this object, a 16 foot square, 8 foot tall room. It's very heavily lit on both sides, and the roof, if you will, is made by the absence of light or darkness. So I'm trying to create works of art that you can't see, but trying to find a way to see them. Laser light got much more ambitious. What they do is they create a physical structure, they illuminate the nature of the medium, and they draw attention to interesting aspects of the surrounding environment. I also got interested, after avoiding the draft, in space development, aviation and space development. Got recruited as a Navy pilot, trained in the F-16, and actually trained on NASA's weightless wonder in preparation to be a mission specialist on flights in the space shuttle. You know the rest of the story. That program ended quickly with Krista McCullough's death on the Challenger disaster. But what I'm really here to talk to you about is my recent work in nanotechnology. And if you will, join me briefly in the quantum realm. It's a place that's so distinctly different from our understanding, you have to let go of your Newtonian world understandings. It's very, very small. It's what we call nanotechnology. It's about a billionth of a meter. Well, smaller than that happened then. It's hard for most people to understand. But to put it in perspective, if you travel at the speed of light, in one second, you travel 186,000 miles. In a nanosecond, you travel 11 inches. So understand, if you will, the relationship of a nanometer to a meter. Very, very small. It's a place where there is no gravity. There's constant motion at blinding speed. There's no color because it's smaller than wavelengths of light. And our typical optical microscopy simply doesn't work. It's too small. It's not a very visually interesting place. What you see here is a SAM, or self-assembly model layer. It's chemistry. I never thought I'd be interested in these sorts of things, but once you get there, it's a very big world. The discipline is being driven by visual images. 20 years ago, if you looked at a science publication, you'd see a couple of grayscale graphs, but now they're very rich with colorful pictures. One of the most significant, there are some iconic images, one of the most significant players in this is a guy named Don Igor, an IBM engineer, who developed or helped to develop some of the early technical microscopes that see, if you will, by touching rather than by looking. They use an electron beam, they develop a topographic surface. And I could realize not only could you see at this scale by using these devices, but you could actually move things at this scale. So in reverence to his company, he spelled out with Adams, IBM. <laughs> now, if you think about how this device works, imagine not being able to see, but just taking a stick and having to push it up and down to try and understand the topographic surface. I don't know about you, but I think of atoms as spheres. Here, of course, we see them as cones. The reason is, there's no way to see the undercut. If you were using that stick and you came across the table, you wouldn't realize there was a void under the table. It would just appear to you 
as a, as a volumetric rectangle. So we see cones, we also see false color. There's a lot of algorithmic manipulation of these images. Again, very interesting realm, very specialized devices to be able to see at this scale. This is another very iconic image by Don Eigler. It's 42 iron atoms that have formed a corral, and within that corral is a standing quantum wave or electron wave. Again, something very unusual, probably more interesting conceptually than it is visually, but still pretty interesting visually. So a lot of speculation in this discipline. Uh, in fact, some of this speculation gives us insight to what might happen in the future. There's a lot of speculation about building robots at this scale, or what's referred to as nanobots, that'll cure our greatest ills. What you see here is a nano louse sampling a red blood cell. And sometimes the speculation misinforms more than it informs. Most people in the medical field will tell you that there's no way that you could hold on to a red blood cell, not to speak of inject something in it or sample something from it. And I can tell you there's no way the machines at that scale are going to look anything like this. This looks like our Newtonian world. We have to get out of the Newtonian world and go to the quantum world. It's going to look much more like this. Things can touch and separate, they can touch and connect, they can touch and combine. And the machines are likely to be a whole lot less structured. In fact, they may fail or miss once in a while. This is a much more accurate description of what happens at that scale. The thing that I really hope you understand, though, is what you're seeing there in terms of time is femtoseconds. So it's measuring this motion in femtoseconds. There's many femtoseconds in one second that there have been seconds in the last 31 million years. I'm going to let that sink in for just a moment. In fact, the development of images and nanotechnology are recapitulating the history of art. We see the Venus of Willendorf on one side and the Nano Man on the other. They're building things at the nano scale and renaming things to the nano scale based on what we know about the world today. In my own work, I do both scientific visualization and fine art. Here, what you see is taking some typical microscopy, stretching out the value range and stretching out the color range, doing away with some of the artifacts. In fact, a lot of things at this scale look like things that are very, very big in deep space. And the work has been quite interesting. These are cardiac fibroblasts, and we're using gold nanorods to measure the mechanical properties of the fibroblasts. What they do is they send out processes. These cells, they interconnect with one another. They communicate so that your heart can beat at the same instant, rather than having everything moving at different times. A lot of my early fine artwork was sort of a parody of the way these images were being manipulated. You can see Don Eigler's electron corral in here, and I built several of my own in the background. And I really don't think most people could tell the difference. It's a fascinating place, and again, I make works of fine art and sort of play around with combining the realms and separating the realms. This is actually a neuron, a three-dimensional neuron that sort of dances across the screen. What I really want to tell you about are these last two things. This is a proposal for an artwork in Bilbao, Spain. It's called, appropriately enough, X's and O's. <laughs> the interesting thing, though, is the X's are covered with molecules that are X's. The O's are covered with molecules that are O's. So when you leave this object, you leave with a visual representation, but also with a physical representation, because they leach off the surface of the object and collect on the surface of your skin. Now, at this point, most people sort of start to squirm around in their seat. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, everything in this room, you, me, this, the walls, everything, are leaching atoms and molecules all the time. We just don't pay quite as much attention to it. And people say, well, how does it get through the glass, or will it run out? No, there are a billion, billion of these molecules in a drop of the ink. And glass, for instance, is a very porous material to something in there. Most recently, I'm doing some consulting for a company in California, a pharmaceutical company called Synthine Technologies. They've invented an artificial blood that's very significant in traumatic brain injury, sickle cell anemia, cancer, stroke. The most important thing about it, though, is that it takes away the need to refrigerate blood, and you can put it in powder form. Imagine the effect that might have on the third world. And of course, I'm doing images for this. We're trying to see how these things are going to look 
how they're going to operate in contemporary life. And the truth of the matter is, sooner or later, everybody in their disciplines realize, realizes what effect they're going to have. I have to admit to you, I realize I'm not going to be a Pablo Picasso or a Marcel Duchamp. But oddly enough, here toward the end of my career, I realize that I may, in fact, have an opportunity to save the world and affect change in culture. Thank you very much.